think you guys understand how amazing it is for me to have her on because this is this is really is going full circle for me. And before I you know I I talked to her here, she's waiting for a second. But before I get there, uh, this is really full circle for me because the first story I ever did in ufology on a show was about the Betty and Barney Hill case. This is back three years ago was the very first episode I ever did that had to do with UFOs. And, I, of course, as everybody who listens in knows, I'm a huge fan of, of ufology. I, I'm an avid ufologist myself. I, you know, do a lot of research on the subject. But the Betty and Barney Hill case, the Travis Walton cases, are the two, you know, to me, are the most irrefutable cases within ufology. So the first show I ever did was on Betty and Barney Hill. And ever since that show, I've done a lot of research on the lady I'm having on tonight, Miss Kathleen Martin. And I've always wanted to interview her, and it's just an amazing honor to be able to say thank you for being here tonight, Miss Kathleen Martin. Welcome to well, the Jackal Set. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm so happy to be with you. It's, it, it's just a, such a pleasure for me, believe me. Believe me, it's a pleasure for me uh, to have you on the show here tonight uh, because, like I said, I've done so much research in your background and uh, in, in, in the stuff you've written in the past. You know, the book Captured, to me, is one of the best books in ufology ever. The fact that you've worked with one of my life heroes, Stanton Friedman, uh, blows my mind, uh, you know, that you've worked with this man. And uh, the books you've, you two have written are just incredible in themselves. And, uh, you know, it, it's, you're, you're just such an, an inspiring person. Of course, the, the work, you know, of Betty Hill and the stuff that they went through, uh, that, their case, Betty and Barney's case, just an amazing case. Anybody who's into ufology and doesn't know the Betty and Barney Hill case in depth, are really not, you know, serious about the subject. Uh, before we continue, you know, on into the book, uh, I do want to talk about that case just in case people are not too familiar with the case. Can we discuss the Betty and Barney Hill case uh, first before we talk about anything else tonight? Certainly we can. Now, for my listeners who are not too familiar, again, can you tell us a little bit about the case, uh, what happened to Betty and Barney Hill? Okay. Well, it was September 19, 1961. And my aunt, Betty and Barney Hill, were traveling home after spending a brief vacation in upstate New York and, and Canada. And they were decided to drive home at night because there was a hurricane coming up the coast. They wanted to arrive home before it struck their seacoast home in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Uh, it was no big deal because my uncle worked graveyard shift at the Boston Post Office anyway. Uh, he was well rested from the night before, and he thought that he could drive home without a problem from Montreal. They're traveling through upstate New Hampshire um, late in the evening when Betty spotted a new light in the sky. And the thing that really drew her attention to it, uh, according to her first report about this, it's documented evidence, is that she at first thought it might be a falling star, but it fell upward instead of following the kind of pattern that a falling star falls in. Um, right. Or maybe it was a satellite. She'd never seen a satellite before. Uh, and she continued to watch it. This was about maybe about 10.30 at night when she first spotted this, uh, maybe a little after. And she watched it for about the next 15 miles as it grew larger and larger in the sky. There was a waxing gibbous moon in the sky that night. It was a clear night. Uh, visibility from the top of Mount Washington, which is the, one of the highest peaks in New Hampshire, uh, was 130 miles that night. And she watched this craft uh, as it was near the, the, the moon. And it was growing larger and larger. And it piqued her curiosity. And she talked my uncle into stopping uh, to have a better look at it. And she watched it. Uh, at that time, the first stop, it was about a quarter the size of the moon. And it traveled over the face of the moon. My uncle watched it. Um, he took the binoculars then. And it traveled toward Vermont and then quickly Spun back in his direction. Uh, it was then fairly large and silent. He could see windows in it. And he got back into the car and started traveling south. Uh, they stopped very soon after that. They'd only traveled about five miles when they stopped again. And Betty had watched it as it passed over 
Cannon Mountain is the name of it. There's an aerial tramway there, a restaurant at the top. There's a signal tower up there. And she noticed that the light blinked out as the craft passed over the top. And, uh, you know, this might indicate electromagnetic activity. And she was totally unaware of what UFOs do at that time. She had no interest in right. the subject. Uh, she and my uncle had never read anything about UFOs at that time. But they stopped again. Uh, by the old man of the mountain, which is just on the other side of the Cannon Mountain aerial tramway, uh, to have a better look at it. And the important thing about this is the old man of the mountain, which is no longer there, it fell off the mountain in 2003, but it was 48 feet from forehead to chin. And the craft, wow. Betty stated, was at least one and a half times the length of the old man's profile. Uh, it had stopped in the sky. It appeared to be rotating. And it was about, they estimated, a 1,000 feet off the ground. And they watched it, and it started to move. And it started bouncing back and forth in the sky and traveling in a stair-step pattern. They got back into the car. My uncle started driving south as she was watching it. As they entered, as they exited the south entrance of Franconia Notch, that's the area that they were in, that's a very uh, popular tourist attraction area because of its uh, scenic beauty, they exited that and they passed the Indian Head Resort. Betty was becoming excited at that point. And Barney was becoming upset because he had to drive the car, and he wanted to see <laughs> what this was that was causing Betty to become so excited. So he thought he'd pull over to the side of the road when he had an opportunity to get a better look at this thing. But before he could even find a place to pull over, the craft shifted ahead and descended rapidly in their direction. It was just over the passenger side of the car, and it stopped about 200 feet above their vehicle. And I want to mention now that this is all conscious recall. Uh, it has been reported by skeptics that uh, all of this was recalled under hypnosis for the first time. Right. That is entirely false. The, all of the original reports will indicate that uh, Betty and Barney had full conscious recall of this. Barney okay. uh, had to stop the car directly in the middle of the road so he wouldn't be directly underneath the craft. Um, Betty and Barney uh, looked up at it. It was huge. It looked like a pancake, a giant pancake at this point. Um, there was a forward row of windows on the craft and through the windows, they could see an intense blue-white light. Uh, huh. the cra Barney stepped out of the car. He had the binoculars in his hand. Mm -hmm. He was uh, looking up at it, but it shifted to an adjacent field just to his left, which would have been to the east of the highway. He followed it into the field, looking up at it through binoculars, and he saw 8 to 11 entities looking down at him. He consciously recalled that they were dressed in shiny black uniforms. He also consciously recalled that they were somehow not human. And that I should have quotation marks on each side of that, somehow not human. Uh, he became very frightened. Right. He looked up at them. They moved to, uh, all but one moved to a panel on the back of this, uh, what appeared to be a corridor, encircling the craft, at least the front part, that's all he could see. And uh, when they did, the craft tipped toward him, and something started to drop down out of the bottom of it. And there were lights that started to telescope, sort of project out of the sides of this. And he received a telepathic, message, or that's the only way I can describe it or he could describe it, uh, to stay where he was and just keep looking. 
He tried to pull the binoculars away from his eyes. He was terrified at this point that he was going to be plucked from the field like a bug in a net. Um, he wanted to escape. He wanted to run back to the car. He was having a great deal of difficulty doing this. But finally, he broke away. And he ran back screaming to Betty that they had to get out of there or they were going to be captured. He started uh, speeding down the highway. As he was entering the car, he noticed that the craft had shifted location again, and it was over their vehicle. He told Betty to roll down her window and look up. She did, and what she saw was blackness, only a black void. She didn't see the stars or the moon or the bottom of the craft. She didn't think. She was looking for light. All she saw was blackness, and then she and my uncle heard a series of code-like beeping or buzzing sounds that seemed to be striking the trunk of the vehicle. It caused the car to vibrate, and it caused a tingling sensation to pass through their bodies. As if only a moment had passed, they found themselves 30 to 35 miles down the road. They heard a second series of beeping or buzzing sounds. They remembered very little of what happened in the interim. Uh, Betty said to Barney, now do you believe in flying saucers? And he said, don't be ridiculous. There's no such thing. <laughs> <laughs> Which is <laughs> kind of a crazy statement considering what had just happened. But yeah. he was in denial. He was a firm. <laughs> Clearly, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that UFOs were not real, you know, that there were no alien visitors or, or anything of that sort. So um, they continued driving home. They did remember observing a fiery orb in the road silhouetted against some trees. They did remember encountering a roadblock somewhere along their journey, but they didn't know exactly where it was. And when they arrived home in Portsmouth, they realized that they arrived a little bit later than expected. It took them a couple of months of piecing together uh, their trip and where they were at what location before they realized that it was over two hours that they were missing. Um, and, and that was very distressing to them because <sighs> that sort of gave them more information uh, that something might have happened during right. that yeah. period that they couldn't recall. Also, there was physical evidence. Betty's dress was mm -hmm. torn in several locations. The tops of Barney's shoes were scraped. He was a meticulous dresser. He had to wear them for yard work after that and buy a new pair of shoes. Uh, their watches that were working fine that night stopped working and never ran again. And there were circles on the trunk of their vehicle that caused a compass needle to whirl when they placed the compass over them, but dropped down when it was placed on other areas of the car. So all of this was very perplexing. They felt contaminated. They made an air, a, a report to the Air Force. Before they did that, Betty called my mother. I was 13 years old and seated in the same room. I became aware of the story that very afternoon that they returned home. Hmm. And we were at their house within a couple of days. I saw some of the physical evidence. I saw the spots on the car. I saw the watches, Barney's shoes. Betty had already taken care of her dress. Uh, but then it unfolded into uh, an investigation. Betty reported it to NICAP. It was investigated by NICAP. Um, and, of course, I, I had mentioned the Project Blue Book uh, Air Force right. report. And it was uh, a couple of years before they were able to find uh, a psychiatrist who used hypnosis. It was something that they wanted to do almost immediately. Betty wrote to Donald Kehoe, the director of NICAP, uh, on September 26, 1961. Mm. Uh, only six days after they arrived home after having this experience. And she right. stated that they were looking, they were considering the possibility of looking for a psychiatrist for Barney because he had developed a mental block uh, after he huh. had observed these 
beings on board the craft. But it took a full two. And that's years. common, though. Isn't that common with abduction? Uh, pay, with abduction phenomena, isn't that common that people block uh, this experience more than you know them just maybe putting them under some hypnosis that they erase their memory? But it's just a common thing. We block really you know terrible events sometimes in our life. Yes, but um, my sense of all of this isn't that Betty and Barney had blocked it because it was so frightening to them. My okay. sense after studying the case is that the ETs had actually done something to block it. Oh, okay. And, and you know, we're working on that sort of thing right now. The, the military is in uh, attempting to control individuals um, to change uh, brain wave patterns and that sort of thing. Correct. So yeah. it wouldn't be unusual for a civilization hundreds or thousands of years ahead of us to already have that technology. Um, so I think that that's what happened with Betty and Barney. And But Dr. Simon, uh, who was renowned in his field as a psychiatrist who used deep trance hypnosis to resolve emotional issues related to trauma, hypnotized them separately over a six-month okay. period. He imposed amnesia at the end of each session, and they both uh, recalled in remarkable correlating detail a UFO abduction uh, by non-human entities and a physical examination and before they were released and sent it all about their way. So, Let me ask you a question. At, at no time, uh, because it, you know, it boggles my mind, at no time uh, did Betty and Barney just say to themselves, you know, before they went forward with, you know, going public with what happened to them, did they had ever discuss, you know, with the family that, you know, maybe we shouldn't go forward with this? I mean, were they ever at any point scared about going forward with it? Uh, they didn't voluntarily go forward with this story. It was uh, released through a violation of confidentiality in 1965, starting October 25, 1965, and running in a Boston newspaper for five days. Their story was revealed through a violation of confidentiality. They were horrified. They, uh, Betty was a social worker for the state of New Hampshire. Barney worked for the post office. He had been right. appointed by the governor of New Hampshire to serve on the U.S. Civil Rights Commission's State Advisory Committee. Uh, he, they were well known in the state for their uh, very positive contributions and political activities. And uh, the worst thing they thought that could happen to them was to have this story made public, but it was. Uh, the consequences were not as bad as they anticipated, uh, but it was a terrible shock to them and to the family. <laughs> no, I can imagine. Did they ever suffer, I mean, I haven't really heard of them suffering any threats or life death threats or anything like that, but did they ever come across people actually, you know, calling them with death threats or anything of that nature? Uh, no, they, as far as I know, they never received death threats. Uh, after Barney's death, it was reported uh, several times that Betty had died, uh, which was quite a oh, shock okay. to Betty. <laughs> that was, <laughs> <I can imagine laughs> that was on radio shows. In fact, uh, I think it was Stan Friedman who told me uh, that he had actually called her home one time because he had been informed that she had died and was shocked to have her answer the phone. <laughs> so uh, that sort of I thing. thought you were dead. <laughs> <laughs> but there were no actual death threats. <laughs> they that's were harassed, it, it, It's an incredible <laughs> it's an amazing, amazing story. You know, the, the the best part, of course, of the entire scenario is the star map uh, that Betty drew. Uh, can you talk about that real quick before we, we go on break here? We're going to go on break in a few minutes, but can you tell us a little bit about the star map that Betty drew? Sure. Uh, when Betty was on the craft, her physical examination was finished, and uh, it was Barney's turn. So everyone... Uh, left for the examining room that Barney was in, and she was left alone with the one she called the leader. 
And she said to him, oh, I know you're not from around here. Where are you from? And uh, he <laughs> produced <laughs> kind of an understatement there. Um, no kidding, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, he produced a three-dimensional map. It um, was later described as a, a hologram or a holographic image. Uh, and Are you there, Ms. Martin? Colored points of light. Some were as large as a nickel, and others were the size of a pinpoint. But there were some that were connected by dots. Some of them were solid lines, the heavy solid lines, and some of them had five or six lines between them, some of them only two lines, some one line, and then others uh, were just dotted lines. And the examiner told her, or she somehow received the message, that the solid lines represented trade routes or air, uh, routes that they traveled to more often, and that the dotted lines were expeditions. Well, under hypnosis, uh, she described this to Dr. Simon, and he gave her the post-hypnotic suggestion that if she could her too badly, and she could remember it accurately, that she could go home and draw it if she wished. And over the next couple of weeks, she did do that. And it was published in John Fuller's Interrupted Journey, the first book that was written, uh, that was primarily written about uh, on some of the hypnosis tapes, uh, very different from my book Captured. Uh, but uh, the map was in the book. Marjorie Fish, who was a brilliant woman from the state of Ohio, member of Mensa and an amateur astronomer, she was a school teacher, um, had, um, had read the book. And she became interested in this. She thought, she was highly skeptical of it, but she thought that if this place existed in our galaxy, perhaps she could find it. So she contacted Betty. Uh, and to find out, as, learn as much information as she possibly could from Betty about this. And she started going to the, the college, to the astronomy department, and borrowing their star catalogs because they weren't readily available. She had to go to the college. And she couldn't take them out and take them home. She had to sit in the, the astronomy department and hand copy all of the information, and then take it home. Do the mathematical calculations. She used monofilament line in, and beads. And she constructed uh, our galaxy, the stars in our galaxy, going out 55 light years. And at first, she didn't find a match. Uh, in, in all, she built 26. Uh, different three-dimensional models of different areas of our galaxy. And uh, at one time, she had 256 stars in their proper three-dimensional location. So you can imagine the work this was. Yes. But finally, she found a match in 1972 when a new Gleesey catalog was released. And in that catalog were three stars uh, that we didn't know about before. But we didn't know about 1961. We didn't know about them in 1964 right. when Betty underwent hypnosis and drew the map. But she then had a perfect match or a very close match for Betty's map. And uh, the sun was in it. And the two primary stars, the largest ones, that were on Betty's map were Zeta-1 and Zeta-2 reticuli. In the constellation Reticulum, uh, it's, they're about 39 light years away, and they can only be seen from our southern hemisphere. Uh, so, and they are estimated to be up, almost up to 3 billion years older than our sun. So uh, this was a, a very significant discovery, 
And uh, it convinced a lot of scientists that uh, Betty's story was accurate. Yeah, that, that sealed it for me. Once I read that report, that I was like, that's it. You know, this is, uh, there's no way that you can refute this case now. I mean, this woman just uh, pinpointed a place in the sky that nobody knew about when she did it. I mean, unless she was a psychic with amazing abilities and, and a hell of a telescope, there's no way that she would ever know this. And that sealed it for me. That was just the, uh, that was the final nail in the coffin uh, in believing that case. Uh, and like I said, I, I've it's it's just one of the most remarkable cases because of all the background work that's been going on on that case since it happened. It, it's just an amazing, amazing case, guys. We're going to go on a quick commercial break. We're going to be back in about four minutes. We got to pay a few bills, uh, so stick around. PSN-radio.com is the website. The chat room is right there. Of course, SoFlow Radio dot com as well you know everybody listening through there thank you for listening and I want you guys to call on in so uh, we're gonna open up the line seven eight six two four five eight one two seven we're gonna talk also about the book when we return the UFOs and aliens is there anybody out there and Kathleen I'm dying to hear how you got involved in this book uh, so I'm gonna ask you a bunch of questions because this is just uh, one of the, the best books I've read in years in ufology so uh, guys stick around we're gonna be right back in about four minutes. Got Miss Kathleen Martin on the line here with me, and we're talking about, of course, the Betty and Barney Hill case. We're going to be talking about the book that she's involved with, an amazing book, UFOs and Aliens. Is there anybody out there? An amazing question for sure and one of the the top questions that I ask all my audience uh, here if it's important to them and it's important to me Kathleen I really you know doing these shows for the last three years now uh, I didn't start off doing radio as uh, I wanted to be a ufologist I started off doing it as a kind of a hobby with friends and whatnot uh, but as, as I got more and more into the whole ufology thing that question is there anybody out there it just boggles my mind that's the most important question I think in mankind and mankind's history Absolutely. Would you not agree with that? Absolutely. I agree. <laughs> yeah, I mean, really, this is just a, an amazing, amazing book. Uh, just, you know, I've been talking about this uh, book for about a month now when I've had all these other guests on. And your chapter in the book, uh, like we've ta been talking about the Betty and Barney Hill case, uh, touches on not only that case but other cases as well. You have, uh, of course, the chapter's called Alien Abduction Factor Fiction. And yes. in this uh, chapter you talk about Travis Walton, you talk about other very famous abduction cases. Can you talk a little bit now about the book and, you know, your chapter in this book in particular? Because uh, alien abductions is as much a part of ufology and is as important to the science behind ufology as anything else, I believe. I mean, it's really the most important part of it because it is the closest thing to evidence that we have, I believe. So can, can we talk about that chapter for a second now? Yes, well, I think alien abduction is very significant because if humans are indeed being abducted against their will uh, all over this planet by an extraterrestrial race of, of individuals, then this is extremely significant and important, you know, because there's nothing that we can do, it seems, to prevent that from happening. But the question is, are abductions real? And I wanted to take a good look at abduction experiences uh, across uh, 50 years, from starting with the 1957 abduction in Brazil of Antonio Vias Boas, uh, going through the Betty and Barney Hill abduction in 61 uh, to uh, the Michael Lapp and uh, Janet mm -hmm. uh, Cornelius abduction from Vermont in 1968, Travis Walton in 1975, and three women from Kentucky in 76. And what I was looking for was patterns in abduction. Mm -hmm. uh, was there anything in all of these different abductions that sort of correlated positively? And so that was my primary focus. And, and are we still seeing these patterns? And how have these changed 
And you know, one thing that I found is that all of these early abductions uh, that were very significant left evidence. Uh, there's very little evidence today. All of these abductions involved multiple witnesses, at least two witnesses. And that's very significant. The people were awake. They uh, had a close encounter with a UFO. Many of them had conscious recall of observing non-human entities on board the craft. They had a period of lost time. Many of them were left with physical injury. Uh, this was medical evidence. Uh, there were other things that happened, such as their watches had stopped running, or the hands on their watches might have been spinning. Um, so, and all of these initial witnesses, except for Barney, who was deceased at that point, underwent lie detector tests and passed them, uh, and they underwent psychological testing and tested normal on psychological exams. So they were very well investigated. Uh, it was very fascinating uh, to, to actually look at the files of these individuals. And my aunt actually knew many of them. She had uh, spoken to them after their abductions to help to calm them down and to help them to, you know, heal emotionally from what had happened to them. Um, and I had information in my aunt's files about these abductions that had never been reported before. So that sort of added to the information I had. And it was a fascinating study. But then, over time, abduction, the, the modus operandi, of the ET seemed to have changed, where people were started being abducted primarily from their bedrooms at night when they were sleeping. Now, it might have started uh, with an abduction from an external environment while they were driving or camping or hunting or fishing, uh, but then it changed. And then, over time, we had thousands of people who started coming forward with the belief that right. they had been abducted from their bedrooms while they were sleeping, mm -hmm. had never witnessed a UFO, had never had conscious recall of observing a non-human entity in an external location. And then the question became, is this a psychological abduction or is this a physical abduction? So I looked at the characteristics of psychological abductions, of sleep paralysis, of hypnagogic and hypnopompic hallucinations, and some of the psychological explanations. And then I looked at uh, the patterns of bedroom abductions and what evidence there is that some people might have been abducted from their bedrooms. So uh, it was pretty fascinating, and uh, I was so happy to be asked to write that chapter by uh, the acquisitions editor at New Page Books. And that is the New Page Books has been the publisher of Captured, the Betty and Barney Hill UFO right. experience, and also Science Was Wrong, the, the book that Stan and I wrote together. We each wrote seven chapters in that, and that was published in 2010. Yeah. So now, uh, about this about this uh, chapter itself, uh, let me ask you a question because I've had sleep paralysis myself. Uh, you know, I, I've suffered from sleep paralysis in the past, and I've never seen any aliens. And uh, to me, that I don't really believe that is a, a real cause. You know, for these abduction phenomenons. Uh, you know, in your writing this chapter, do you believe you know that to be at all a cause for some? you know, alien abduction, you know, cases? Uh, yes, I do think, and I am an abduction researcher and investigator, and I do think that right. some cases have all of the characteristics of sleep paralysis. Uh, the people wake up, they're probably lying on their backs, they right. uh, see, uh, they sense that someone is in the room, they sense a presence, they cannot move any part of their body except for their eyes. 
they try to cry out, but they can't move. Their tongues, right. um, they, they might uh, get some air up, but that's about it. They see in, generally in color, even though it's a darkened mm-hmm. room, uh, ETs, maybe they see only the heads. Maybe they see three heads floating at the, the foot of their bed. Uh, then the next thing they know, they're waking up. And uh, they ha- suspect that they might have been abducted. So it is possible. See, I've had all that. I've had all that except for the aliens. I've never seen the heads or the floating heads, but I've had just about the entire scenario except for that uh, yes. myself. So it's amazing. So people have actually reported, uh, you know, the cases, and you determine that that would definitely fall under sleep paralysis. Uh, yes, they fit all of the characteristics of sleep yeah. paralysis, and these are generally people who know quite a bit about, from you know, popular culture, about what aliens are supposed right. to look like. They might... <laughs> watch horror movies about ETs, or they're, they're familiar with the subject, and it, it might be fear that causes this, but researchers uh, tend to think that this explains at least some of the alien abductions that people are reporting. It certainly doesn't explain the ones where there is physical evidence. Right. Uh, there are multiple witnesses, or people are taken from an external environment, uh, or people end up uh, locked outside of their homes with no way to get back in. There was one guy who ended up on the roof of his house without a ladder. I mean, uh, you can't explain those as sleep paralysis for sure. But, no, but, no kidding. But some things can be explained as sleep paralysis. No. You know, it's amazing. I, I feel real bad for myself now because I'm a huge, you know, junkie of ufology and aliens, and I've never had the the pleasure of seeing some floating alien heads in one of my my sleep paralysis, uh, you know, events that I've had in my life. Because I, I've literally I've suffered from sleep paralysis since I was an early teenager. Uh, I've had it, you know, throughout my life. I'm just kind of used to it at this point. I've never seen anything at all scary. I'm kind of ach- I'm ashamed of myself right now because I figured I'm such a big fan of the, of ufology. I should have seen something by now, Kathleen. It's, it's, it's shameful for me at this Do point. You but uh, maybe in the future I have one. <laughs> Do you see geometric I You know, I kind of do sometimes. Okay. I'll say that. That's a, that is, uh, if you're waking up, that's a hypnopompic state. And generally people with hypnopompic hallucinations and sleep paralysis are observing geometric shapes. Or they might even see monsters. Uh, they might see a number of different things. Uh, and uh, you know, probably less frequently among people who suffer from sleep paralysis do they see <laughs> aliens, but it is possible. I'm, I'm just, I am feel bad for myself. I haven't seen any of that. I'm just uh, ashamed right now. But, you know, talking about physical evidence, there is one case in the entire spectrum of ufology, which, of course, had not only, you know, physical evidence in the sense that a person went missing and went completely off the grid, uh, for days on end, and had public looking out for him. There was a manhunt out for this man. Uh, of course, I'm talking about the Travis Walton case, and you touched about this about his case on the book as well. Uh, let's talk about his case for a second, because his case, just like the Betty and Barney Hill case, to me is the probably you know th- they're the two cases in ufology where you know nobody I think can really poke a hole in these two cases. Uh, you know, doing your research on the Travis Walton case, what have you come up with as far as the answer for what happened to Travis? Because I believe that he definitely went through this experience and. He saw something, something happened to him. Uh, you know, I, I'm a 100% believer of his case. All of the evidence points to a real UFO abduction. Uh, he was 22 years old. He's uh, returning home from work. He, he and his co-workers uh, are driving down a dirt road off the side of this mountain. When they see a light, they drive closer to it and they realize that it's a hovering disk. Uh, He foolishly uh, jumps out of the the vehicle. He's hit by a beam. He loses consciousness. Uh, The other men think he's been killed. They flee in the the truck, uh, and then they turn around and they go back and look for him. He is missing. Uh, It's reported to the sheriff's department. There is a manhunt for him. Uh, going on for five days. The men who are um, 
on his, uh, who are working with him, his co-workers, are, come under right, suspicion of foul play. They all take lie detector tests to prove their innocence. And they pass them, all except for one, and that is equivocal. He passed, mm -hmm. Alan Dallas, passed all of the parts of the lie detector test that he took, but he became angry and walked out. He told the, the examiner off and walked out. And that's why they said that the results were equivocal. It wasn't that he'd failed it. It's that he walked out of it. He later took the lie detector test and passed it. Uh, Travis initially, when he was returned five days later, woke up on the road um, outside Heber, uh, ended up, uh, he, he was in bad shape, really, emotionally. Yes. Yep. He had lost a, a lot of weight. He had uh, mm -hmm. five days beard growth. He uh, was dehydrated. He was having some, some serious emotional problems as a result of what had happened to him and the mm -hmm. memories of this. Um, and... Mm -hmm. He was subjected to a lie detector test way too soon because, right. uh, you know, what it will record is his emotional response. And he was highly emotional at that point. So he didn't pass the first one, but he took several follow-up exams and passed all of them. His psychological testing showed that he was normal, he was stable, he was not lying, he was not fantasy-prone. Uh, all everything in his case indicates that it was a real case. I know Travis personally. I've had the opportunity within the past year to talk to him at length to really get to know him, and he is a very solid individual, and and I believe in his honesty, and I think based upon. I've read all of his, all of the original reports. Some, the debunking began almost immediately. The lies yes, began it did. almost yeah. immediately. Mm -hmm. And it's revealed in these original reports. Uh, but, boy, uh, it, Travis is a solid person, and he never deserved the debunking that he received and the poor treatment that he received at the hands of debunkers. And that hasn't stopped. I mean, there was recently online a few months ago uh, a report uh, that somebody dug up from the Internet from a couple of years ago, and they made a big hoopla about it, about some uh, kid who's a nephew of the sheriff who was involved in the hunt for Travis Walton the day, he, you know, the week he went missing, uh, saying that, it, you know, that Travis faked the whole thing and, and you know, a whole bunch of nonsense. Uh, and they reported that all over the Internet, like if it was some big news, to kind of, you know, poke fun at Travis Walton in his case when it really wasn't ever proven. Uh, there's never been any evidence uh, that this person even exists. They just took, you know, literally something from some website and they saw it from a few years ago and they ran with it. It's amazing what Travis has really gone through in the last 20 plus years after having this experience. I mean, I talked to Travis myself a few times and I've had him on the show and he's always said this to me and he said, he said, Jackal, I would, if I had to do it all over again, I would wish that none of this have had happened to me. Oh, at absolutely. All. He, I mean, he, he doesn't like this at all that happened to him. He's not happy oh, with no. this whatsoever. No, he, he is not happy about it. He, he wishes it never had happened. Uh, and, you know, in, in terms of debunking, one of the men who worked with Travis was actually offered $10,000 to lie and to say that it was all a hoax yep. and he was part of that hoax. But he refused to do it to his credit. And so who, who is so invested in this that they were willing to pay somebody $10,000 to lie about it? I, I don't understand that personally. Why, I mean, why would people invest their time and energy unless there are people behind the scenes uh, with a bigger agenda? Uh, I mean, that's what I think. That way. I think it's either fear or it's a larger agenda. 
I think I think it definitely is. I mean, I've been a proponent of uh, you know the disclosure project with Steve Bassett, and we've talked on you know on record and off air, me and him, about uh, the entire conspiracy to withhold the information from the American public. And I think, without a doubt, that poking holes or trying to poke holes in, in stuff like the Travis Walton case and trying to ridicule the man. Uh, is the, the perfect way to conceal the, the truth because people are gonna, you know, you can make him, you, know, you can make him look bad on a show somewhere like where Travis was not long ago, where he did some uh, TV show. Uh, I don't know if you ever saw this, Kathleen. He did a, a TV show where they actually had him, you know, do, doing like a lie detector test on air, mm-hmm. and they asked him a bunch of questions. He passed almost every single one of them until the last one. Uh, where it was kind of inconclusive or kind of, you know, it didn't really uh, jive and he failed it. And, uh, you know, because of that one question, they kind of just started making fun of uh, the whole the whole thing. It, you know, that's the perfect way for the people behind the agenda to cover up or conceal the truth. So I, I'm completely sold on the fact that what they've done to Travis for the last 20 plus years has been a well-planned, calculative, uh, you know, thought out, agenda to try to destroy this man who really does not deserve it because he is one of the most genuine people I've ever had the pleasure of speaking with. Absolutely, and something that I have observed is the more credible the case, the more Mm -hmm. evidence there is in the case, the more the debunkers will attempt to destroy that person, to destroy their character. They've done it to Betty Hill. They did it to my uncle. They try to make people think that my Aunt Betty was delusional, that my uncle was psychotic. It's completely false. And that's part of the reason that I wrote Captured, to present the facts about them. Um, As soon as Betty died, I knew that they were going to finally attempt to dispense with the case entirely, to destroy it. And they did come right. out with a campaign of additional campaign of disinformation about her, and and you know it's time to fight back. It's time to tell the truth, and 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 to fight for what is true. I'm completely with you. I, I agree 100 percent. And the um, you know the most we could do as a society is you know hammer the right people over the head with we want disclosure now and of course I'm talking about everybody in Congress everybody in you know in power and political power uh, as a people we just have to you know completely endorse Steve Bassett and what he's trying to do with the disclosure project uh, you know, how do you think that's ever do you think that's ever going to happen Kathleen do you think we're ever going to have disclosure in the near future because uh, honestly at this point society is ready for it I, mean, I don't I think, think general, that all for members the most part, we are. of society are ready for it. Uh, and when we're talking of society, we have to think beyond people who live in the United States. We have to think about the world. And who speaks mm-hmm. for the world? Nationalism is the name of the game. So who speaks for the world? And who is going to determine uh, whether or not there will be disclosure? Uh, if we have disclosure and we have it soon, I think it will be because the ETs have decided that they're going to make their presence known worldwide. I, it probably won't come from the head of any particular government. Um, and I'm not sure if it, if it did come from our world governments that we could all agree that we are all ready that we are all financially stable enough, our economies are good enough, our religious institutions are solid enough, our societies are solid enough that we will stay together, that we will remain solid, that our institutions will stand up, that we won't have uh, a society that uh, becomes uh, 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 or where we have a greater degree of alcoholism and drug abuse than we have right now. This is going to be a huge cultural shock. Uh, one thing that I, I like to compare this to is as people age, they have more and more difficulty accepting the rapid technological changes that we have in society. It's almost as if they, have, they can't keep up with it. Well, imagine if all of us were suddenly exposed to technological 
changes and advances that were thousands of years ahead of us right now. And suppose hmm. we were in contact with an alien civilization that couldn't communicate with us the way that we communicate. Suppose it's telepathic. Suppose it's totally different from our kind of language and our way of communicating. What impact would that have upon the world? So I'm not sure, and I'm not sure that uh, the heads of governments are sure, that full disclosure would be a good thing. I think that limited disclosure would be good. At least, uh, why, why isn't the decision made that someone could announce that, yes, we have been visited? Even if they want to right. announce that we were visited only a few times and that they've gone away. Right. I mean, they can lie and say that if they want. But, right. but let's, uh, let's come clean and, and stop denying all of this evidence that we have. And it, there really is a lot of evidence. I mean, it's been stockpiling over the last century. It's amazing the amount of evidence in ufology proving that there is something going on. Not only that, I mean, there is, of course, the Roswell case, uh, which to me is another one of these ufology cases, uh, which is never going to go away. The Roswell case is never going to go away from the pop culture. Uh, this is another one of the most amazing you know, cases in all of ufology, so it's never going to go uh, away, no matter how hard the government wants it to go away. But here's the thing. I think that very soon there is going to be some kind of disclosure, and it might have to do a little bit with the Roswell case, and this is why I say this, Kathleen. Recently, I don't know if you've read about this, but it was announced that the Vatican and NASA, and NASA are going to get together to announce a very big... Uh, you know, very big event that's going on, or something really big that they're going to disclose in the next, in the near future. And they haven't really talked about what it, exactly it is yet. Uh, but it's just, it's funny to me that NASA and the Vatican are going to disclose something to the public, and they're saying it's a big deal what they're going to disclose. I think that's one way that you can kind of get around uh, disclosure being such a a weird thing for for people who are might, who might not be ready for it if you do it through religion. And it's funny that the Vatican is getting so open now to the whole, you know, spectrum of ufology. You know, recently they came out and said, yes, you know, aliens could be real. They're all part of God's plan. Yes, yes. And, and that was a really significant step forward yes. for, the, for the Vatican to, to make that statement. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure how far it spread, if it spread beyond the UFO field, um, but... Uh, yes, it was a significant move forward. I mean, if you think about it, the Vatican coming forward something like that, after you know the recorded history of the Church in the last you know few few centuries, uh, yeah. for them to actually come forward and say, you know, this could be real, mm -hmm. aliens could be part of God's plan. That to me is it's amazing in itself, and I think is right along with the next few steps. I mean, do you think there's anything significant about 2012? Because everything seems to be kind of you know, spiraling towards 2012 when it comes to ufology and a lot of the paranormal stuff that's been happening on this planet for the last uh, 15 or so years, or 20 years, or 30 years, or 50 years, you, hell, for the last 100 years, everything is kind of like, you know, to, to me is spiraling to 2012 for some reason. Do you think there's any truth to 2012 at all? I have a wait and see attitude <laughs> about that. <laughs> I, you know, I'm... I'm hoping that we don't have uh, destructive changes to the earth, but you know there are certainly a lot of destructive things happening now on earth, and uh, you know right. we seem to be going through a shift and and uh, what is happening is, is not very positive, and I hope that we can work our way out of all of this just as we have in the past when we've had. Uh, these downturns in the economy, and we've had our social problems and our political problems, um, you know, and, and our volcanoes erupting and earthquakes and, and tsunamis. It seems that, that all of this is happening at once, but uh, I have a wait-and-see attitude. I'm, I'm trying to remain optimistic about all of this. <laughs> I know a lot I'll of tell you what, it, it really, 
<laughs> people are... I, I, I'm the, I'm telling you, I'll tell you what, if it does, uh, if it is the end of the world and 2012 does come around, and I said it here before, I'll be like the guy in the movie, Woody Harrelson, the character he played with the uh, radio program on the movie 2012. That would be me. Uh, well, I tell you, I'm not going to have a big party and spend all of my money in anticipation that the world is going to come to an end. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it, it is funny. People like to jump to that conclusion immediately when, you know, the whole thing could be nothing more than, uh, you know, maybe we'll be enlightened somehow. Uh, well, that would be, be nice. step in our evolution. <laughs> that would be very positive. Exactly. But, all became but it's amazing how... how it's amazing how the religious sect in this country, or in, in the world really, has kind of latched on to the end of day scenario, and people who are, you know, reading about 2012 and about the Mayans and about the whole calendar ending on that date, you know, everybody seems to be latching on to this idea that it has to be a negative thing, where in, in reality it could be nothing more than just that they just ran out of, you know, room on the calendar, they just said, you know what, we're not going to continue writing because we've written enough dates in this calendar, and quite frankly, they could continue in 2,000 years. So it was an important was the day so, Tol Toltecs invaded and, uh, and conquered <laughs> the Mayans. <laughs> and maybe that's why it stopped. Who knows? Exactly. I mean, the possibilities are endless, but it's amazing how this society has kind of latched onto that and kind of made this whole doomsday you know, scenario uh, as almost, uh, it's almost like they're wishing something like that happened. You know what I mean? Yes, well, you know, there's money to be made. We're a capitalistic society, and there's money to be made through fear and through conspiracy theories and, and uh, end-of-the-world kind of scenarios. So, uh, yes, and, and I think that uh, a lot of people do latch on to that kind of thing. Look, I'm getting a question here from uh, Facebook. Uh, okay. We have a listener who wants to know. Uh, by the way, anybody listening on Facebook, you want to ask any questions, the, the Facebook page is facebook.com forward slash the jackal. Anybody who knows me on there, please ask away. I have a question uh, from uh, a lady who wants to know, uh, Miss Kathleen Martin, in all your years of investigating ufology cases, uh, what would you say is the most important case in the entire spectrum of ufology? Wow, that's a heavy loaded question, by the way. Oh, <laughs> well, I have to divide that into two parts. There are um, abductions on one side and uh, UFO encounters on the other side. Uh, and, boy, um, certainly Roswell is a very, very significant case with the documentation, with the number of eyewitnesses, uh, with the sworn testimony, that, that's a pretty solid case uh, because of the documentation. Um, and uh, on the abduction side, there's the Betty and Barney Hill UFO abduction case, and I think that, it, uh, that the Travis Walton case is a close second to that. I would agree, 100%. Uh, the Travis Walton case, again, it, my God, what a phenomenal case that was. And, you know, it's such a shame. Uh, the movie that came out didn't really depict the exact scenario of what happened to him, of what he remembered. Uh, wouldn't it just be great if they could go back and redo his movie and really show what he wrote in the book? Because the book is so much more amazing than what they actually, you know, ended up being on film. Yes, absolutely. You know, the film distorted the information. I was told that uh, the funds were going to be withdrawn unless they made it into a horror movie. So it's not really, uh, it doesn't well depict what ha actually happened right. to Travis. And he would love to see another movie made that's more accurate. And just for anybody who's not aware of what I'm talking about, of what's so different between the two, uh, in Travis's original story and the real story of what happened to him, he saw human-looking aliens uh, which, it's a little bizarre, but at the same time, it kind of goes along with a lot of other reports of Nordics and such. Uh, have you found in your research that a lot of folks are seeing these type of aliens that are human-looking? Most of the early uh, abductees saw uh, the second group that Travis saw, which uh, fit the description of the ones that my aunt and uncle saw, and those are the greys who are about four to five feet tall, uh, hairless, grayish-colored 
skin, um, the large almond-shaped eyes, uh, very tiny nose, just upturned uh, nostrils, a slit for a mouth, no ears, just maybe a hole. Um, you know, so that is what most people see. It's very interesting that mm -hmm. Travis saw these uh, human-looking individuals on board, but they looked a little bit different from humans because they looked uh, enough alike to be identical twins. The women did and the men did. And their eyes were kind of amber. He said they looked that there was a difference between them and the way that humans appear as well. So, uh, you know, I don't know. I don't hear many cases of people encountering um, you know, pe people who look human, there are reports of contact with the Nordics who tend to be, uh, according to reports, very friendly uh, people who uh, have the best interest of humans in mind, uh, who are more spiritually advanced than we are. Um, but, and, and of course also there are the MyLab abductions where there are reports of people being abducted by um, military black operatives who are somehow working uh, with the ETs to abduct individuals. But I'm still waiting to see convincing evidence of this, such as multiple. Listen, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of multiple witnesses reports, uh, I, I mean, the Travis Walton case, of course, has multiple witnesses reports. Uh, yeah. And he saw, you know, the human aliens, but their report of the other witnesses, they didn't see any aliens, obviously. But have yeah. you actually researched cases where you have a couple that have been taken, other than Bar Betty and Barney Hill, but a couple or a group of people that have been taken and they've all shared an experience, like more than two or three people? Um, it's generally two or three people. Um, John Carpenter, okay. who is a UFO abduction researcher, did come across a case where there were more than three people. There was a group of people who were camping uh, together. And he hypnotized them. And uh, yes, the group was uh, uh, told the uh, very similar details of their abduction account under uh, hypnosis. So yes, um, of course, there was the Allagash abduction in uh, the Allagash area of upstate Maine, where there were three individuals. There was another huh. convincing case. And in um, UFOs and Aliens, I wrote about the case of three women in Kentucky who uh, told uh, there was physical evidence in their case. Um, under hypnosis, they all described very, very similar details about uh, the interior of the craft, the ETs and the examinations. I talked about uh, another case investigated by Walter Webb where there were two individuals who, um, and Walter actually did a comparative analysis of their separate statements under hypnosis, just like I did with Betty and Barney. And uh, there were remarkable similarities um, of uh, the details of what happened to them. Uh, m much more than would happen by chance. No, speaking of Betty and Barney, real quick, I have a question from the chat room. They want to know, in your book, Captured, uh, Betty described the alien's mouth to have a membrane uh, covering it. Does Betty know what the membrane was for, uh, perhaps uh, to help them breathe or in their atmosphere or keep them safe uh, or safe from the air itself? Uh, she's always wondered this question, and this is coming from Solanemia in our chat room. Uh, can you expand on that uh, that itself, the membrane that covers yeah, the mouth? Yeah, Betty and Barney both described that membrane. And uh, okay. we can only speculate that, you know, and Betty and Barney speculated that perhaps it was uh, to protect them from any germs that we might have, um, or maybe it was just part of their bodies. Maybe it was their... You know, they didn't observe teeth inside their mouths. Uh, maybe it was just part of their anatomy. We don't know what, why they have it or for what purpose. 
I have another question here. This one's again from Facebook. Uh, June wants to know if you've seen the video uh, with an alien reporter from being from the Roswell crash. Uh, the alien video just was posted a few months back on the internet. Uh, they're labeling it, labeling it the Skinny Bob video, and they want to know if you've seen this video. I believe that I have, and I believe that it uh, is believed to be a hoax. Really. Has there been any any research behind the uh, behind this video? Because I haven't really heard much on anybody uh, working on uh, trying to figure out if it was a hoax. Has somebody come forward uh, pretty mu pretty much debunking it? Uh, the, you know, I receive reports like this on a regular basis. It's kind of a wait okay. and see thing. And a few days later, a photo analyst has come forward, or someone has come forward and uh, determined that. Uh, it, it is not valid. So um, I, I don't remember the specific details, but I do recall seeing something about that. And, and it's I don't amazing know. when somebody could do that. Uh, that kind of really makes it hard for ufology to prove anything at this point because it's so easy to, to do CGI. And, and most 15-year-old kids now, when they're home, they can download a program and start creating CGI if they know what they're doing. Uh, and That's it's easy to learn. Okay. All these programs are pretty simple. They, they do, and they, they post it on YouTube, and so much of it is hope. Uh, if somebody really and truly does have um, that kind of evidence, they should go to someone like the Mutual UFO Network, who has the investigators uh, and has the scientists who can analyze it. That's the route they should take. Posting it on YouTube is about the worst thing that anyone can possibly do in order to attempt to prove anything, in my opinion. I completely agree. I completely agree. But you know what? After the alien autopsy video of the 90s, uh, after that was kind of debunked, to me, it, that said to me that it's going to be almost nearly impossible at this point uh, to ever come forward with any video evidence that could really prove anything, because anything could be created easily at this point. Even back in the 90s, people were already hoaxing stuff like that, uh, which... At that time, I completely fell for it, I must admit. I thought the alien was real, and I thought this was finally proof that they are here, or they were here, or they've been here. And, of course, that's been since uh, debunked, has it not? It's possible to analyze the film, it, to mm -hmm. try to determine um, how old it is, and what camera it was recorded on, and, you know, that sort of thing. So if you can actually do an analysis, on the age of the film, it will give you some indication about whether or not it's real or not. But it's getting your hands on the on the actual film that's the problem. With well, the yes, host, you'd have to. Bob video, for example. Whoever <laughs> has it would have to come forward with it or yes. to mail it anonymously to someone like the, the Mutual UFO Network or um, who could. Um, turn it over to scientists who could analyze it. I, I hope, uh, you know, one day we get some real credible evidence. I really would like to see some real proof. Uh, Kathleen, you know, we're, we're running short on time here. Before we let you go, though, I want to know what's, what are you working on now? What's the latest stuff that you're going to be putting out after this book, this amazing book, again, UFOs and Aliens? Is there anybody out there? What are you working on next? Well, I have just worked for the past year on producing a DVD. It's titled Betty and Barney Hill in Their Own Words. And it's actual excerpts from the hypnosis tapes of both Betty and Barney. I'm the only person who has the legal right to do this. Uh, I'm the trustee of mm -hmm. their estate. And it's uh, 132 minutes long. It uh, takes you as they relive under hypnosis their experience through the entire experience um, from the beginning of their trip uh, through their observation of the craft through their abduction there are excerpts on there that no one has ever heard or read before that I've decided to release um, all the way to their arrival home uh, to the way the compass reacted when they placed it over the spots on the trunk of the vehicle. You'll hear Betty's statement, and then you'll hear Barney's statement. There's also a short interview with me, uh, an introduction, and I comment 
throughout, uh, from time to time, throughout, just to, to make things clear. And uh, it is set to video in part. I went, uh, I've traveled the route, I've photographed the route. You'll see the photograph. Um, Bob Terrio, who did the production uh, for me, um, used video. So you can actually see what Betty and Barney were observing. You can watch the craft move. I've, uh, Patrick Richard, who was a very talented artist from New Mexico, did several paintings. I commissioned him to do paintings of uh, Betty and Barney uh, Betty during the abduction and the capture. And, uh, you know, so, and there are also archival photos. And it is available only on my website. Um, I, because of the content, I want to sell it in, in bookstores. But you can purchase it at www.kathleen, K-A-T-H-L-E-E-N, hyphen, Marden, M-A-R-D-E-N, dot com. You can go to my website, and it's there. <laughs>